Hi, everyone, and welcome to the uh, Self Care Forum podcast. I am your host, Dr. Cedric Bachatu. This podcast is meant to empower you to address the root cause of your disease. We interview health and wellness professionals with interesting perspectives. Our goal is to interest you in the care of the human frame, in diet, and in the cause and prevention of disease. Our guest today is none other than the vegan Mani herself, Mani Parsons. Mani Parsons has always been interested in nutrition, health, and wellness. She studied health science at Lincoln University and received a master's in human nutrition from Columbia University's Institute of Human Nutrition. Community nutrition, nutritional education, along with cooking and baking are some of Imani's passions. She currently works as a middle school health and wellness teacher while operating her and her own nutrition and baking business, Vegan Mani LLC. Imani has been vegan for over four years and she aims to encourage, empower, and educate people on the importance of healthy eating and living a healthier life. You can follow her on Instagram at veganmani LLC or visit her website at veganmani.com. To start off, Imani, thank you so much for joining us, taking the time to come on this self-care forum podcast and talk to us about the benefits of plant foods. I'd like to give you the floor to say a few words of introduction. Thank you so much. It is such a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me to talk on this podcast. And I'm just so excited to talk to everyone about the plant-based benefits of eating plant-based foods. Very much appreciated and welcome to the podcast. So uh, before we get too deep into it, let's talk a little bit about you. Uh, You weren't raised a vegan, uh, but uh, you've been vegan for four years now. Um, You know, uh, when we look at and consider cultural uh, you know, cultural influences and even national influences. This isn't exactly uh, the Western or the American diet. So I'm curious to know what, uh, why did you adopt a more plant-based and vegan lifestyle? What inspired you uh, to make this adoption? That's a really great question. I would say that I've always been interested in nutrition. In high school, I actually saw the film Super Size Me And that just really just got my nutrition radar up. I couldn't believe the things that were happening in the video. And I really just had this deep hatred for McDonald's, but that's besides the point. And then I just realized, I just started wondering about what's healthy, what's not healthy, what makes a food healthy, what foods can I eat to become healthy? And that interest just stuck with me all the way to college. And my mom, when I was in high school, she actually didn't want me to go vegan just as yet. Um, So I had to wait until I was in college and I made the decision to go vegetarian because I was actually a student athlete at the time. And I thought that would be what was best. And I did this after actually watching Vegucated, which is a really interesting nutrition vegan documentary. And I just realized I wanted to make a change. I didn't like the way that food was produced. I didn't like seeing all the videos of animals being just pumped up with different hormones and having cancer within the animal being cut out. So then I knew I needed to make a change. I also did my own additional research. And then after graduating college, I realized that I was still holding on to the dairy and that was something that I needed to let go because I knew all the problems and the issues associated with eating dairy. And once I became vegan after college, I just really noticed a lot of different changes in my life. And I just started to feel more energized. I started to feel lighter. And I really felt like the healthiest version of myself. So no, I was not raised a vegan. I came from a Southern family, but I ultimately made that decision for me and for my health. You're right, some of those documentaries I've seen. Um, you know, and there are other documentaries such as uh, one that comes to mind is Forks Over Knives, which, you know, extols the benefits of, you know, a plant based lifestyle. So they're very impactful. Uh, But, you know, I can imagine going from, you know, how you were raised to this new lifestyle, this new dietary lifestyle was not an easy transition. I mean, you know, I can imagine just the difficulties in, in shopping different you know, in buying things that maybe you weren't all that familiar with, that you didn't grow up consuming in, in, in uh, excessive amounts, but now you're forced to make this change. But of all these differences, perhaps one that's most impactful uh, and meaningful 
is the cost, the cost factor. You know, for anyone looking to adopt this, uh, you know, plant-based dietary lifestyle, cost would likely play a role uh, in, in how far they're going to go or whether even they're willing to try uh, this lifestyle. So, uh, for example, it's cheaper to shop that, uh, to buy foods and groceries at ShopRite uh, than Whole Foods, for example, right? So how can someone go plant-based on a budget? Excellent question. I would first say that you want to really focus in on food without labels. So buying a lot of fruits, buying a lot of vegetables, foods that are unprocessed, natural foods, because that is where you're really going to get the bang for your buck. And it's also going to be super healthy and nutrition for you. And it's also going to be very fulling. Um, I would also recommend that if you have to use frozen vegetables, or canned vegetables, that is completely okay. Everyone's economic situation is different. Um, of course, we know that fresh is best, but let's face it, sometimes you may not have access to fresh vegetables depending on where you live, or maybe you're in a rush and you just want something really quick, so you might use something canned or frozen. And I do wanna ensure you that when things are frozen, um, they're frozen at the height of ripeness. So that's when you're really going to get the highest level of nutrients and minerals found within that product. And when you're purchasing canned vegetables or fruits, I want to make sure, and even canned beans and vegetable proteins, I want to make sure that you're looking at the sodium levels and you're also looking at the ingredients and the sugar levels. A lot of times when things are canned or even frozen, they add things in there. So just make sure that you're looking at the nutrition label. I would also say to shop in bulk. And this is a really, really big tip. When you think about things such as beans and flowers and dried fruits and nuts and lentils, all of those things can be found in bulk. And when you buy them in bulk, they tend to be a lot cheaper. I would also say to try farmer's markets, also try CSAs. CSA stand for Community Shared Agriculture. So that basically means that someone who has a farm, they act as the producer and then people join that community shared agriculture to get the harvest every single month or every other month. And they'll be able to reap the benefits of getting fresh fruits and vegetables and other products at a very low price. Um, CSAs can be found in a lot of different areas. All you have to do is basically Google CSAs in your areas. You can also shop at Misfits Market, which allows you to get ugly vegetables at a cheaper price, but there's nothing wrong with um, ugly vegetables. They're still perfectly good to consume. Um, you can also try fruit and vegetable stands and small stores that carry fruits and vegetables. Asian markets also have tofu and fruits and vegetables at lower prices. I would also say to plan ahead. Please, when you're going shopping, please make a list. Please make a detailed list of what you're making for the week. And if you wanna go plant-based on a budget, I would definitely recommend making quick and easy, simple meals. Stick to meals that contain starches, also plant-based proteins and veggies. And my last tip would be to shop in season. Right now it's pumpkin spice season. You see pumpkin literally everywhere. It's Thanksgiving. So you see a lot of collard greens. You see a lot of yams. All those things right now are in season. It is their prime time. So when it's their prime time, that means that those items are going to be cheaper and they're also going to be really, really fresh. Thank you for that. And you're right. I mean, try getting a watermelon during the... Uh the winter, you know, if you, if you can find one, it's, it's going to cost you an arm and a leg. Absolutely. You're absolutely right. So, you know, to that effect, thank you for those tips. Um, you know, we're seeing trends. Uh, what's trending now is healthy eating. You know, you're seeing things such as the uh, meatless burgers, right? Uh, there's even a product called just egg, which is plant-based. So we're definitely seeing trends where more and more people are, increasingly mindful of their food, where it comes from, and especially what it does to their health. Uh, and so for someone who wants to start this, uh, you know, this plant based or vegan journey, um, you know, what are some tips that you would give them uh, things to look out for maybe? 
Excellent question. My first tip would be research, research, research. Mm -hmm. Of course, I'm an expert in this field and you're an expert in your field as well. Um, but you need to make sure that you're conducting your own research because you want to make sure that you have that connection to your research because you know yourself better than anyone else. So making sure that you research, whether that research looks like a documentary or maybe that research is a book or maybe an article all those things can help you to learn more about plant-based eating. I would also say try out vegan foods of the foods that you usually eat. So if you're someone that really likes ground beef, um, maybe you can try to make a ground tofu. That's a great substitute. You can also um, try out different plant-based burgers. If you're a burger person, if you're someone that loves vegan coffee, there are tons and tons of vegan coffee creamers. So that would be something that would be super helpful to you, especially in the beginning of your vegan journey where you have to substitute. I would also recommend knowing yourself. As I said before, you know yourself better than anyone else. So you need to know, hey, can I start um, cold turkey? I mean, cold, to um, cold tofu or uh -huh. can I actually um, have to take small steps in order to transition to a plant-based lifestyle. Everyone's different. Everyone has their own speed. So knowing what speed works for you. I would also say to familiarize yourself with the preparation, the storage, and also the uses of different vegan food. Um, knowing what to do with tofu. That's a really important thing that you should know as a beginning plant-based person. You can make a scramble out of it. You can put it in a, um, in a stir fry. Some people even add soaking tofu to smoothies. So knowing things like that can definitely help you out in the beginning phases. Also remembering why you started. Do you want to take this journey to reverse a chronic disease that you may have? Do you want to stay around to raise your grandkids? You have to really know why you're doing this. And it has to be deeper than vanity. This is about your health. You have to have that personal connection with this transition. You also want to make sure that you're getting enough iron and B12. Those are things that come up a lot. And if you are not um, properly substituting things, you can definitely lack in those two areas. So I would say for iron, you can definitely make sure that you're eating lentils, chickpeas, beans, tofu, also cashew nuts and chia seeds. And for the B12, nutritional yeast is a great source of B12. Also fortified soy and almond milk, plant-based meats and fortified cereals can help you to get your B12. Now, I always hear okay, that vegans don't get enough protein since they don't eat meat. How true is that? And if so, where do you get your protein if you're, if you're uh, following a vegan lifestyle? That is completely not true. <laughs> vegans are not lacking in the protein department at all. Um, it's something that they don't have to worry about. Um, that's a misconception that vegans don't get enough protein. I would say that there are several different places that vegans can get protein. You can even get protein from hemp seeds. You can get protein from chia seeds. Chia seeds have a little bit of protein in there. You can eat tofu, you can eat beans, you can eat protein-based pastas, you can eat adaname, you can eat seitan, um, you can eat black beans, you can eat lentils. There are so many different forms of plant-based proteins. And I will suggest trying out all of these different forms of protein and seeing which one you like the best and also cooking them different ways so you know um, which way you like the best too. Because maybe you don't like tofu that is baked. Maybe you might like tofu in a scramble form. So just keeping those little things in mind when you're experimenting with plant-based proteins. And you know, if I may add, um, I was recently doing a cholesterol seminars and I am getting my notes in order. And, um, you know, one of the things that stood out and I thought I'd share it with this uh, audience is the fact that, you know, cholesterol will come from meats and animal products, but plants generally don't have any cholesterol that they're offering, uh, you know. So if for someone who may be struggling with heart disease or maybe mindful uh, to lower their cholesterol, for example, you know, going green, uh, you know, would really be a, a boon. It, it would not only uh, does it not add any more cholesterol to your bloodstream, 
but it actually provides you with uh, antioxidants, which will essentially help clean, uh, you know, uh, the free radicals that cause the damage and, and thus leading to the increase in uh, liver production of cholesterol. So it's also something that, uh, you know, I wanted to highlight as a benefit to uh, going green as uh, <laughs> or going vegan. But so um, effectively, for those who do go vegan, they have to be mindful of, uh, you know, certain nutritional deficiencies. You mentioned some of them like iron and, and vitamin B. But what about, for example, you remove dairy uh, and dairy products. So I assume you're not getting as much calcium uh, because your, you know, milk generally tends to be fortified with calcium. What are some alternative, uh, you know, ways in which you gain your calcium? Mm -hmm. That's a really great question. Dark leafy greens actually contain calcium, also tofu. Tofu had calcium in it as well. And you mentioned fortified dairy products. They're also fortified plant-based products. So you can get fortified milks and sometimes that may have um, that particular vitamin in it or even fortified plant-based cereals that can have that in there as well. Um, so that's something that you can incorporate into your diet and also eating a lot of vegetables that contain that as well. Excellent. Thank you. Would you suggest maybe supplementing as well? Get taken a supplement that carries or contains, uh, you know, most, if not all of those nutrients. I would say definitely take a supplement if you need it. Um, make sure that you're working with your doctor to see where your levels are. And if you, if your, if your levels are low, I would definitely recommend um, incorporating a supplement, but I would first emphasize trying to get it from foods and see, seeing how that goes first. And if it, that doesn't go well, and you still need a little bit more, then you can add on supplementation. Thank you, Imani. So as a nation, you know, we're plagued with chronic disease. And we're seeing, you know, just a greater awareness, just like we're seeing with, you know, food and, and what's happening to a lot of the products that we consume. We're seeing people sort of question, you know, the narrative of, you know, everyone's got to get cancer. You know, they're seeing trends that, hey, you know, uh, I'm likely to have diabetes. I'm more likely to have heart disease, all these things. And people just are not willing to accept these things. I mean, just for example, uh, we're plagued with uh, some of the five chronic diseases that plague this country as a whole, heart disease, cancer, stroke, uh, COPD, and diabetes. And if we just stick to diabetes, for example, one in 10 adults, uh, about 11% of the country um, are considered diabetics. And that number is estimated to go up as high as a, you know, a third of all adults in the next 20 years. Um, right now, we have over 80, 88 million Americans that are pre-diabetics. So that means if things continue the way they, they have been, these people will become full-blown diabetics in the next 20 years. That's where we get our one-third of, of uh, Americans will be diabetic in the next 20 or 30 years. So with that being said, for those who are pre-diabetic and those who are essentially at that same phase for cancer or, you know, high blood pressure, prehypertension, whatever you call it, um, what can be done? Um, you know, what are, what are uh, essentially, what are some of the benefits to adopting a plant-based lifestyle in order to combat these chronic conditions? Plant-based lifestyles tend to be richer in nutrients. So a lot of plant-based foods provide fiber and antioxidants, as you mentioned before. And plant foods are also richer in potassium, magnesium, also vitamins A, C, and E. And plant-based diets can also help you lose excess weight. But I do want to make a statement about vegan foods. All vegan, all plant-based foods are not created equally. Um, so if you're trying to lose assets weight or just get some of these benefits, you need to stick to eating whole foods, foods that are natural, foods that are unprocessed in order to reap all of these benefits. I'm not talking about Beyond Burgers and vegan junk food, not saying that you can't have that once in a while, um, but strictly speaking to benefits, you want to make sure that you're eating whole foods that are unprocessed. Plant foods also help to lower your blood sugar levels. A lot of plant foods have a low glycemic index. So basically what that means is it doesn't spike your blood sugar levels as high and you also don't have that crash 
Whereas a lot of animal-based products, they tend to be more in the high glycemic index side, which can create that roller coaster of just your blood sugar levels going up and down and up and down. Um, plant foods also help to improve kidney function. And I wanna speak a little bit more about um, just one person in particular that has changed their particular lifestyle and direction pertaining to a chronic disease. And this person is Eric Adams. He is the mayor elect, and he actually completely reversed his diabetes by eating a plant-based diet. Wow. And I want to say to you that he did not eat Beyond Burgers. He did not <laughs> eat Impossible Meat. He ate fruits and vegetables. And I've heard his talk and his story so many different times. He stated that he was actually going to go blind at one point. It was that severe. His diabetes was that severe. And he also talked about amputation. And through his, through his eating, he was able to reverse this. And I'm just going to say this one more time. He did it by eating whole foods that are unprocessed, not vegan junk foods. Um, plant foods can also um, prevent chronic diseases, as I just mentioned, not only diabetes, but heart disease certain cancers, high cholesterol, all those things can be re reversed, reduced, or even prevented by eating a plant-based diet. And plant-based diets also provide you with a healthy gut. Um, in the nutrition word, in the nutrition field, sorry, um, there has been a lot of emphasis placed on gut health. Gut health is super important because gut health and digestion go hand in hand. A healthy gut essentially is a healthy you. Um, so if you have a healthy gut, your digestion system is going to be running a lot smoother. And something about plant foods is that it contains a lot of fiber. And we all know fiber helps things move along, which is very important when it comes to the, the digestive system. Um, so if you look at more animal-based diets, those tend to not have a lot of fiber. So digestive systems are slow and it also causes constipation. So eating plant foods is really, really great for your digestive system. Plant foods are also really good for chronic inflammation. And mm -hmm. this once again, goes hand in hand with digestive problems. And also um, plant foods can help prevent high blood glucose levels. Hence why um, Eric Adams was able to reverse his diabetes through eating plant-based foods. And last but not least, of course, we know that plant-based foods are environmentally friendly. A lot of pollutants that come from places where animal products are produced, they can be caught in air as well as water. So we wanna prevent ourselves from taking in all the toxicity and the chemicals that are produced through these factories. And by not eating animal-based foods, you're decreasing your, um, your eco footprint and also not contributing to that cycle of toxicity that exists in the places that produce animal-based foods. Very true. Speaking of uh, Eric Adams, uh, the uh, mayor-elect of New York City, there's a similar story with, uh, um, he's an author. Uh, his name is Dwayne McCulley. He's actually from my hometown of Rochester, New York. Uh, he's the author of a book called Death to Diabetes. And he had a very similar story. Um, to uh, the mayor Alex, uh, his story was, um, you know, he went into a diabetic coma uh, and they were, uh, uh, they suggested amputating a leg. Of course, his mom got involved and his daughter got involved and they said, no, we're going to just, we're just going to make him uh, change his lifestyle. So um, he adopted essentially a plant-based or whole foods diet. And, and, and lo and behold, in a few months, he was off all his meds, including the insulin. Um, but it took a lot of discipline. It took a lot of work. Uh, it took a lot of education. Um, but he documents all of that in his book, Death to Diabetes, which is an excellent read. I, I've read it. I love the book. Um, but, you know, even with that, I noticed you made a difference between um, you highlighted a difference between plant based and whole foods based. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Yes, I definitely can. When you say plant based foods, that's just referring to the general umbrella of foods that are made from plants that don't have any dairy products in them, don't have any animal products based in them. So if you're saying plant-based, plant-based can be a Beyond Burger or it can be 
a um, a process like vegan pancake or um, vegan cake is considered plant based. Mm -hmm. um, vegan ice cream, that would be a plant based ice cream. But when you're talking about whole foods, you're talking about foods that tend to not have nutrition labels, um, foods where nothing is added to it or taken away from it. Um, so whole foods would be things like collard greens. Collard green is a whole food. Also quinoa would be a whole food. Um, peaches, watermelon, cucumbers, all those things fall into the category of whole foods. Also beans and lentils, those are all whole foods because it's literally just that food. There's nothing added into it or taken away from it. Ingredient list is very short and to the point Whereas plant-based foods can have multiple different ingredients and there are they can be processed to some extent. All right. You mentioned things, uh, you know, plant-based products such as Beyond Burger. What are your thoughts on that? Is that a healthy thing? Should people be consuming them as opposed to meats? Good question. Um, so I want to just say this too. I'm not be um, bashing Beyond Burgers. I think Beyond Burgers are delicious. Um, but I would say I eat them once in a while. I definitely wouldn't eat them every single day um, because as I mentioned before, um, Beyond Burgers, Just Eggs, Impossible Foods, vegan tunas, vegan ice cream, vegan cakes, all those things are processed to some extent, meaning they have added salt, they have added sugar, they have added ingredients, um, making them not the healthiest of all foods. It's okay. still something that can be enjoyed in moderation, um, but it's something not to be a staple in your diet and eat every single day. Um, so I would say in comparison to meat, of course, they're a lot healthier. In comparison to animal products, yes, they are healthier. Um, but as far as when you're trying to emphasize just reversing chronic diseases and becoming a healthier version of yourself, you need to make sure that you're not eating those like vegan junk foods all the time. You can have them in moderation, but just not every single day. And yes, they are delicious. Just want to say that as well. Mm -hmm. um, but that's my take on those things. Very well said. Thank you for that. Because I, 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 I always wondered why, you know, um, you know, how can they remain healthy if, for example, they're being cooked in the same oil as, you know, the regular burger meat or something like, you know, at some point throughout the process of, of manufacturing or making uh, the, you know, the Beyond Burger, they have to sort of compromise the health benefits. Um, you know, at least that's kind of how I thought. Do you have anything to add to that? Oh, yes. Um, I want to just highlight that a lot of different places that aren't even vegan are offering vegan options because they're seeing that, hey, this is lucrative. Um, a lot of people are going vegan, let's offer a vegan burger, or let's offer a vegan this. When you have to think about those places, it's like, are they offering it for a health benefit or are they offering it for a monetary benefit? And a lot of times it is a monetary benefit because the options that they're providing aren't necessarily healthy. And once again, if you want to eat these things once in a while, it's completely fine. I'm a person that enjoys a vegan piece of cake or a vegan burger just as much as the next person, but not having it all the time. Um, but I would say to really make sure that you do your research and make sure that you're eating foods that make you feel good and foods that are healthy. And when you see these places coming out with different plant-based foods, ask yourself, um, is this the best option? Yes, it is healthier than animal-based foods, but you wanna make sure that you're eating for health. Eating for health is really important. Thanks, Amani. So there's an old saying that goes like this, when America gets the flu, Black people get pneumonia, right? Highlighting the severity of disease, chronic disease in the Black American community. So I want to talk a little bit about our community, um, the Black community in America. Uh, too often, we are saddled with the worst, uh, you know, disease and health outcomes. Uh, many people like myself, uh, we, you know, believe that a lot of this has to, you know, comes what well, goes back to our diet, you know, the idea that, um, you know, uh, there's soul food, which is, you know, our, our cultural foods, really. But it, unlike other cultures that really had the chance to develop their cultural foods over centuries, 
um, you know, with without anything being necessarily imposed upon them. You know, we unfortunately didn't have the, those meetings to determine what's going to be healthy, what's going to be unhealthy. And so uh, for a lot of Black Americans, you know, a lot of the culture of food comes from the history of slavery and the trauma and the way that they were fed, um, and which was not necessarily the best. Um, but you have an interesting take on, on soul food in the United States. Um, I'd, I'd love to hear that. What's the history of soul food uh, for the Black man and woman in America? Yes, definitely. We have to think back to the time of um, slavery, where slaves were growing the fruits, growing the vegetables, growing all of these crops. And when I think about that time, you have to th also think about the meat industry. So the meat industry was a lot different. Um, animals weren't pumped with hormones. There wasn't this really big mass production of animal products where it is today. And of course, you also have to think about the costs. Um, back in the day, not everyone could afford meat. So a lot of people who didn't have a lot of money, of course, slaves during that time, they, they weren't paid a lot. So when you think about like the diet that they had, it was mostly plants and like a little tiny bit of meat. But the bulk of everything that we ate were plants. We had this connection to growing these foods and cooking these foods. And then when you think about colonization, um, where the salt was brought over, the sugars were brought over, the fats were brought over. All of those things, of course, change the direction of food and hence creating the soul foods um, that tend to have more salt, more sugar, more animal products. Um, but then when you think about the base of it all, um, soul food is primarily made with okra, with collard greens, with yams, with black bean, with um black eyed peas, all those things are plant foods. So we really just as black people need to get back to our roots, get back to having that connection of growing our foods and eating plants and cooking them and get back to that mentality of not having a lot of animal products in our diet because plants were our staples and we had that sacred connection to plants. And I, I see this a lot in the urban, urban farming movements that are happening Mm -hmm. around different places in the United States. Like even people that are black and young people are um, moving on to growing their own foods. Mm -hmm. And they're doing this because they notice that connection and they wanna make sure that they're able to provide for generations to come. And they're not having to deal with relying on other people for food and being self-sustained, especially in communities where they don't have a lot of access to healthy foods. Um, so that's just something um, to think about. We're connected to plants more than we know. And we really need to honor that and embrace that. Well said. And, you know, I, I um, once gave a, a speech, I, I did a seminar and one of the um, uh, women in attendance, you know, I asked a question, uh, why do you think that, you know, Black people, Black Americans uh, don't necessarily have access? What are some impediments to us having access? And, you know, uh, one black woman, you know, got up and grabbed the mic. And, you know, one of the things she said, which was interesting was, you know, uh, uh, it's easier and a lot cheaper to feed your family, um, you know, with McDonald's than it is to find a Wegmans, which are uh, somewhat equivalent to Whole Foods here um, and, and go shopping there. Because generally the idea is, hey, it's going to cost you a lot of money, whereas, you know, going to a fast food restaurant, it's very simple. And so for a lot of our people, uh, that seems to be a challenge. Um, not just our people, but lower income uh, people in this country, that seems to be a challenge where uh, you have easier access to a bodega than you do to a Whole Foods or Wegmans or, you know, a grocery store for that matter. So what can be done with regards to that? Um, to sort of lower the bar or th the threshold to getting access to these, um, you know, plant foods or even whole foods? I would say starting where you are. Um, the first thing, of course, is education. Um, but simply just nutrition education, of course, that's not going to work. You also need resources. Um, so definitely educating 
com those communities on the importance of eating healthy, the benefits that comes along with that, and also giving them access on how to cook these healthy foods. And I would say going to the places within that community, talking to the people that hold um, that hold the power in deciding what goes on in the community, the officials, maybe the people that own the stores, talking to them and making sure that they understand that health is a priority. You want healthy foods, supply and demand. Um, if they see that you're buying these healthy items, of course, they're going to bring more of that into the community. Um, as I mentioned before, there's also a lot of different movements going on. I live in New York City. Um, so in a lot of these communities, what they're doing is creating um, gardens. So one organization comes to mind and I absolutely love this organization's mission. Um, it's called Harlem Grown. And Harlem, as we all know, that's a community that doesn't have a lot of access to healthy foods. Um, so Harlem Grown actually grows fruits and vegetables and other like healthy produce to be able to take those fruits and vegetables and give that out to, um, to community members. And of course they don't have this at a really high price. So starting more movements like that where people in the community um, start these community gardens and also um, a lot of different churches, a lot of different community centers also take it upon themselves to um, give out healthy foods to the community. So that's something else that happens as well. Um, I would say providing these communities, as I mentioned before, with cooking classes. So teaching them how to create these healthy meals and making sure that it's simple, affordable, and accessible. Um, and last but not least, just making it fun, making it fun to cook these healthy foods and knowing that it's bigger. It's bigger than every single person. It's the whole purpose of this is to create essentially generational health. So not only just keep that knowledge and that information within one person, um, but just have that person go out and spread it through the community. And none of this is super easy. Um, it takes hard work. It takes dedication. It's something that um, is still a struggle for a lot of people to find out, like, how can we get healthy food access in these communities? But I feel like um, if you just start that conversation, you'll begin to get the ball rolling slowly but surely. Um, because I am seeing changes in communities that don't tend to have a lot of access to healthy foods. And we just have to keep pushing and keep educating. Excellent. So along this line of petitioning, um, you know, I want to dip a little bit into the political realm, just a little bit. You know, the last year, two years, you know, we've seen a lot of, uh, you know, protesting. We've seen a lot of political activity or activism with regards to Black Lives Matter. And, you know, though things have calmed down the last couple of months, um, you know, nevertheless, people are vigilant. Um, people are, uh, you know, uh, protesting some of the grievances um, that have taken place with regards to police brutality. Though this is a good thing, you know, we have to call out fault wherever it lies. Um, we're not, you know, bashing the boys in blue or whatever, but, you know, we have to hold people accountable. But, you know, given the immense attention that has been placed on the Black Lives Matter movement, the enormous amounts of money, uh, you know, that's been raised by these organizations, I want to talk about a greater plague on the Black community, and that is, uh, you know, health, okay? <laughs> We're dying uh, at, at far greater, it's incomparable, to what uh, police brutality has done. Um, and these are unfortunately unnecessary death. So my question to you, Imani, is this, if black lives do matter, what would the black community be doing differently to preserve the lives that we currently have? Um, first and foremost, we need to start being honest with ourselves and we need to bring in that accountability factor and understanding that we have the power um, to change our lives. So we have the power to eat healthier. We have the power to work out. We have the power to manage our stress better and just really owning that, that we have our responsibility to, to make these choices. And I would say we can start by educating ourselves. Like we know that this is something that is affecting our community. So, hey, what can we do about it? Um, what, we can also educate the younger generation as um, older people in this generation, we are um, 
the people that tend to buy food for the households. So we need to make sure that we're buying healthier foods. We also need to tell um, the young ones why we're buying these foods, why it's so important to eat them, um, because education is so um, important. I would also say um, that I would make sure that um, you just really understand the bigger picture, as I always mentioned before, um, that this is not only about us, it's about the health and it's about the further existence of our people. So we need to start making those changes. Um, when I think about Black funerals and when I think about um, Black churches, um, we need to talk about health. We need to make sure that if we're at a funeral and someone passes away from a chronic disease, we wanna make sure that we're not um, serving the same food that led to that chronic disease. Making that change, serving healthier foods. Also churches, it's important to talk about health in church too. Um, you can pray, oh, I want to lose the weight or um, I wanna do this within my health, but are you taking the action? Are you using the wisdom um, that God is giving you in order to make that change? And you have the power to do that. Like, yes, prayer works, but are you using your wisdom in order to make that change? Um, I would also say just making our community strong and being able to share information. Sometimes people may wanna keep information to ourselves, but we have to understand that we are a community. So if you know something that can change someone's life or um, you know something that can improve someone's health, making sure that you shout it from the rooftop and you help your brother, you help your sister, because if you don't give them that information, where are they gonna get that information from? They may not have ever heard of eating healthy or working out, but you can be that person that really speaks to them. Um, so those are just a few of the actions that we can take because we wanna create generational health and we wanna make sure that we get healthier. And I love that. Uh, you know, when you were talking about going to black funerals and ultimately eating a lot of the same foods that caused the death of the individual. I thought about a movie, the movie soul food, mm -hmm. you know, when big mama, you know, she passed away and the family gathers together. Yes. To keep her memory alive, but <laughs> they're eating a lot of the foods that led to her detriment. Mm -hmm. And, and so it, it's almost like, you know, it's almost like that same circle it just continues to go. But also another point that I, you know, I love that you uh, emphasize the importance of prayer. Yes, spirituality plays a role. I mean, I, I grew up in the church, uh, North Greece Road Church of Christ out in Rochester and, you know, predominantly African-American church, wonderful people. But again, growing up, I saw people praying, uh, you know, asking for prayers for health and, and wellness and betterment. But unfortunately, um, many uh, of those prayers just went unanswered. And how could they be when the individuals are continuing to live the life that brought about the condition or that is keeping the chronic condition uh, active? And so it, it's almost like you can't pray for help with your diabetes or your high blood pressure and turn around and eat the things that are going to maintain the status quo. It, it doesn't work like that. What can you say to that? Um, you know, to the importance of spirituality, uh, you know, in, in uh, maintaining a better state of health. Mm -hmm. um, what I would say is that you have to put the work behind the prayer. As I mentioned before, you can't just say, hey, wait, go away, God, please let this weight fall off. Mm -hmm. Like you need to work out, you need to eat healthy, you need to do all of these things because if you're not doing anything, um, it's, it's not gonna be answered as you said. And as I mentioned before, I think that we need to talk about health in churches and religious spaces because health is so very important and we know that there, this is an issue for the black community and we need to make sure that we're addressing these issues. Um, the hard issues that are hard to talk about, we need to make sure that we are talking about that um, in church. And yes, that may be uncomfortable because I feel like with food, it's such a personal thing. Mm -hmm. um, everyone loves their grandma's sweet potato pie or their auntie May's fried chicken. Yes, we, we love it. It's amazing, it tastes good, but hey, um, is it good for our health? Like, is it beneficial? Like maybe we can tweak it just a little bit to make it healthier. Maybe we can swap things out to make it plant-based and see how that goes. 
Um, so just being open and willing to talk about those issues, bringing in nutritionists, bringing in um, health and wellness professionals within those spaces to share that information and understanding that it's an, it's an important thing to talk about. I would definitely say that. And God wants you to be healthy. I feel like that's another thing that we need to realize. Like God didn't place us here just to live and, and die. He wants us to thrive. He wants us to Amen. live and um, live in his will and also fulfill our purpose in life. How can we do that if we're not healthy ourselves? We can't, it's impossible. So realizing that health and literally purpose, they're, they're connected. That's right, that's right. And you, besides, your family needs you. Uh, they love you. Uh, nobody wants to see their loved ones suffering. Um, you, you know, the harvest is plenty. The laborers are few. Hence, God needs you alive here on earth. He doesn't need you in heaven. He needs you here. Um, speaking of grandma's sweet potato pie, <laughs> you, know, um, you know, where can we find, where do you yourself get your recipes? Where can we find, you know, recipes maybe to start this journey of, uh, you know, healthier eating? Good question. I actually have three recipes on my website, www.veganmani.com. Mm -hmm. And I have some really good recipes on there. I've had a lot of people try them out and really like them. Even people that are meat eaters have liked my recipes. And speaking of sweet potato pie, I don't have a sweet potato pie recipe, but I do have a sweet potato um, pancake recipe, which is absolutely delicious. Maybe you can make that on Thanksgiving morning. Mm -hmm. I also have a savory collard green recipe. I have um, a spiced potato recipe, a soup recipe that's made with squash that I really like to have in the fall time. I'm sorry if I'm making anyone hungry. If you didn't eat before <laughs> that snack or something. Um, and I also have a smoothie bowl recipe that's pretty good as well. So I would really um, highly recommend checking out those recipes and also just staying tuned because I plan on uploading a lot more. Well said. Thank you for that. So for those of us who, you know, um, you know, are interested in starting this journey of healthier eating, certainly we, um, for many people, they need a hand, uh, someone to hold their hand and sort of walk them through this journey. And this is something that you do. Um, how can we work with you and what, what are some of the services that you offer? You can work with me in a lot of different ways. I provide one-on-one -on -one nutrition consultation. I provide group nutrition consultations. I provide nutrition workshops and I also um, do supermarket tours and I also do plant-based cooking classes. So I do a lot of different services. Um, if you would like to work with me, you can simply just go to my website, www.veganmani.com or you can also follow me on Instagram at veganmani.loc. And something that I will want to emphasize is that I do offer a free 15 minute phone call. And this consultation is to see if we are a good fit. I do not like taking people's money. It is not my aim. I don't do this um, for monetary reasons. I make sure that my prices are affordable. And I also have a payment plan as well. If people need to utilize that service because I'm, I'm really um, stern on making sure that people have access to me and the information that I have. Um, so as far as my consultations, consultations are usually 45 minutes. Um, there's a different amounts of consultations that you can book. You can book three consultations. You can book six consultations. You can book nine consultations. And what I do is I map out your nutrition goals and we come up with a plan for you to make sure that you are successful in those nutrition goals. And not only do I meet with you for the, that 45 minutes, I also check on you throughout the week, see how things are going, see if we need to adjust. Um, and I also send you out resources. So I'm not just seeing you one time and saying bye, I'm checking in and making sure that things are working. For my nutrition workshops, I've talked on a lot of different topics. I've worked with the elementary school population all the way up to the senior population. Um, I love talking to every single group there is about food and nutrition. I've delivered talks at Black Veg Fest. I've also done stuff for sororities such as the AKAs. I, I spoke at their wellness event and I'm also doing something for them um, this week about nutrition. So I really make sure that I provide these services just to give as much information as I can. 
as far as my supermarket tours, now that the pandemic is getting a little bit better, um, I am able to conduct supermarket tours again. So if you're someone that needs help with shopping, you don't know what to buy. Um, maybe you just need some hand holding with planning out your meal prep, reading nutrition labels. I can help you by doing a nutrition market supermarket a supermarket tour. And that also comes with a consultation where we actually map everything out. And that comes with my um, supermarket tour guide, which has a lot of really great information. And last but not least, um, just the nutrition workshops, again, those are really great for different schools, organizations, corporations. Um, so feel, please feel free to reach out to me about that. And if you need to reach me via email, you can also reach me at veganmanynutritioncoach at gmail.com. Thank you for sharing those. Um, I'm told you're also, uh, uh, you also bake, you're also, uh, uh, you also have baked goods, correct? Yes, I also have baked goods. Funny story, I got into baking by accident. Um, but I'm so thankful. I feel like I'm someone that believes everything happens for a reason. And I want to tap into everything that God has for me. And apparently he likes me to bake too. So I'm rolling with it. Um, but I was actually waiting to start a job and I was cooking and baking away during this time period, starting a job as a nutrition educator. And I made brownies one day because I am a huge fan of chocolate. Yes, I am a nutritionist, but I love my chocolate. I don't eat it every day, but I eat it often. Um, but anywho, um, I made these brownies and then I realized, hey, these are really good. So I had my sister um, try them and she said that they were really delicious and tasty. So I decided to roll out my vegan brownies. I have an original brownie. I have a chocolate wasted brownie. I also have an almond craze brownie. Um, they're all absolutely delicious. I also make date sugar cookies and I also make tahini um, banana bread. So those are all the items that I have. And something else that I um, like about my products is I don't use any refined sweeteners. Everything's sweetened with agave. I use organic ingredients. I don't use a long laundry list of ingredients for my baked goods. I also use spelt flour which is high in whole grains. And it's actually an ancient flour that has a lot of health benefits. Um, so I love to just pair nutrition as well as baking together. Well, Amani Parsons, I wanna thank you so much for just taking the time and joining us for this interview. Thank you for revealing to us the many benefits of plant foods, certainly allowing us to have access to your contact information uh, for follow-up. Uh, I want to transition now into some of the Q&A, um, allowing those in the audience who will have a question to, uh, you know, bring them for, uh, in the chat box. So this one is for you, uh, Amani, and it says, can being vegan impact your hormone levels? Um, that's a good question. And when I'm thinking about hormone levels, I guess, Nini, can you clarify if you're talking about soy? or not, because a lot of people have an ideolo um, ideology about um, hormone levels in soy. A lot of people say if you eat soy, that will mess with your estrogen levels, but I've looked at different articles about that, and it actually doesn't have an impact on your estrogen level because it's a different type of estrogen, so that doesn't um, influence any of your estrogen levels. So soy is completely okay to consume. If you're referring to that particular hormone, well, she did come on a little late, but she wanted to know why you chose to be a vegan. If you can just rehash that for us, please. Thank you so much. I um, picked to be a vegan because I saw everything that was going on in the food industry as far as how animals were being treated and also just how meats were being produced, dairy products were being produced. And I knew that I didn't like it. And I knew that I wanted to um, do better and consume plant-based foods, because that's when I felt like I had the most energy. And it was really just a personal decision on what was best for me. I did do it because of health reasons, all of the reasons that I have mentioned today. Um, and I definitely feel a lot better ever since going plant-based. I've been plant-based for over four years now. Um, I've been to doctors, my, all my levels are good. Um, and it's just really changed my life for the better. I have more clarity, I feel lighter. And I feel like I'm in the healthiest 
um, shape of my life ever since going um, vegan. So that's why I chose it, mostly for health. But then later down the line, I also learned about um, environmental reasons and also the animal reasons on why um, going vegan is super important. Well said. And another question, uh, you touched upon this earlier on, but for those who kind of joined us a little later, um, how do you make sure you get enough of the uh, nutrients that you're, uh, you know, that you can't necessarily uh, obtain from plants? So we're talking about B12, we're talking about, you know, some zinc, we're talking about calcium, for example, how do you make sure uh, that you get those in your diet? Excellent. So as far as um, B12, I do take B12 and I do take iron. So I take both of those things um, to make sure that I'm staying on top of those levels and also eating foods. And the supplements that I take, B12 and iron, those are the two that I take. Just uh, one more thing, if you could just highlight some of the things that, you know, because in the chat, there was some discussion about, you know, artificial meats and some of the things uh, that are done to meats, uh, you know, that sort of not just turn you away, but, you know, that we can all agree are definitely unhealthy, um, you know, just even for meat eaters or omnivores as a whole. So what are some things that you find that are being done in the processing of meat products that, you know, are, you know, are detrimental, are detrimental to our health? Mm -hmm. um, first and foremost, as I mentioned in my talk, um, processed plant made, um, processed meat products or meat like products. Um, that's something that I typically, typically don't tend to recommend, of course, have those things in moderation, but I don't consider them to be healthy at all. Um, a lot of the times they're adding in artificial flavors, artificial fullers. They're basically tweaking a lot of different things in order to get a certain flavor and a certain texture out of the product. Um, so they're also adding a lot of sodium and a lot of preservatives to make sure that these um, products last long. And yes, salt, they add sugar, anything that they can to enhance the flavor. Um, so I would say that eating those things, of course, as I mentioned before, it's not healthy, everything in moderation. Um, but that's what I really dislike about these products. And I spoke earlier about different places that are not vegan, that are offering vegan um, items, they're doing the same things with their, proce um, their products. They're processing them, they're adding all these artificial things into them. So of course, that's not healthy at all. So that's why I recommend eating whole foods, foods that don't have nutrition labels, foods that are not processed. Um, those are a healthier option. So instead of having like a Beyond Meat burger, if you want to make that healthier, you can make a black bean burger and you can do that yourself at home instead of buying some of these products that can be processed. Very well said. Are there any other questions? Or a quinoa burger, yes. All right, with nothing else, right, feel free to unmute Amani Parsons. Yeah. I want to thank you for taking the time mm -hmm. out of your Saturday. Mm -hmm. Joining us in life right, with, with nothing else, the benefits Look, of Amani food. Parsons. I want to thank you for giving us time side of Saturday. the argument. Joining us in life essentially, you know, the benefits of plant and food. sort of the deficiencies. Thank you for giving us it, all really sides of the argument, all gaps. sides of the debate. Uh, we know that you know, the benefits and, foods and sort of the deficient health that arise with it. But you know, whether someone wishes to go all vegan, we know that plant foods plant based more plant foods in their diet. You've certainly given us whether someone ways in which we can do that. All vegan or incorporating incorporate and on more budget, plant so, foods in their diet. Uh, you know, on behalf of the audience in those ways in which we can do that uh, later on, I want to know thank you and for on that. a budget. So, um, uh, you know, again, you know, on behalf of the audience, give you those last minutes, the last words uh, later just on. I want to thank you for uh, this that. video for those um, who are watching. You know, this again, will be I want to give you the last minute, the last word to just give out your contact information. So, this video for those who are watching, this video will be Imani Parsons at Vegan Mani. Vegan in the chat and, and uh, so please go and subscribe and follow uh, vegan money uh, money parsons at uh, vegan over money on that's vegan but go ahead you have the last eight how can we get in touch for nancy i thank you as uh, you vegan mentioned money you can follow LLC, me on instagram at uh, over vegan on instagram LLC. but go ahead you have the last and word how can we get in touch go to my website thank you as you mentioned you can follow me on instagram at not least you can also email me at and you can also go to my website email thank you so much everyone for and last but not least you can also email me at vegan money nutrition coach at gmail thank you so much everyone very well said thank you so much
much. And I want to thank the audience for taking the time and joining us and um, everyone for your informative, uh, you know, your very well set things you so much. And I want to thank the audience for taking the time. Please go ahead and subscribe to my YouTube channel for a few days. I'll have your video uploading your thoughts there so you'll have the issue. Please go ahead and subscribe to my YouTube channel. In a few days, I'll have that money uploaded there so you'll have for those of you who missed really beginning because you'll be able to watch the audience members did not see the things that Imani uh, covered not able to um, join I know a lot of very questions uh, because she really covered a lot of those because, things so uh, some of the audience um, I want to encourage you to go not and subscribe and please uh, follow not Imani join us at the on, very beginning uh, Instagram uh, and certainly a lot of those website, things so, um, I want to encourage you listen to the audio version of the self-care forum podcast on Spotify Apple and Google podcast